Hi everyone. Hi everyone, welcome. Good to see you tonight. Thanks for thanks for coming out this evening. You're really welcome here. Um, yes, if you're used to being at these kind of things or if you're new here tonight, it's really good to good to see you. Particular respect, I think, for those who have been on the youth weekend away. I heard of a 12 o'clock bedtime, and then that was up by someone saying it was a 2 o'clock bedtime <laughs> for one of the groups. So uh, was 10.30, what time they went to bed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, a seasoned leader, uh, fantastic. Um, brilliant, well we're thinking about this big, yeah, big question tonight. Um, why so much violence uh, in the Old Testament? And uh, I, I have to admit, I feel a little bit overwhelmed uh, doing this because it seems like every sermon or talk that we've heard in the book of Joshua so far, the answer has been, Nathan's going to do an evening on that and then we'll have all the answers. So thanks uh, Ben and Ed and anyone else who said that. Uh, I can't promise all the answers but we'll dig into it in more detail perhaps than we've been able to at other points. But just as we start off, you're kind of in groups if you're not sure who you're with, uh, just turn to the person next to you. And just a, a question to discuss for a few minutes. When it comes to violence in the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, what's your natural sort of response, natural reaction? Is it, this doesn't feel very Christian, uh, I prefer the New Testament, I'm fine with it. It was quite specific a long time ago. This makes me doubt God and what is written in the Bible. I'm not sure, and I'm hoping tonight will help. <laughs> uh, yeah, or, or other. Just discuss that in your groups for, uh, for a few minutes. And, I'm already hearing some, uh, some very interesting discussions going on that I quite want to join in with in different groups. But that's got us going, thinking about this, uh, this big question tonight. Uh, well, if you were here this morning, uh, Ben did an excellent sermon looking at Joshua chapter 6 and the Battle of Jericho. And uh, if you missed, missed this morning, I definitely recommend just catching up with that on YouTube and hearing, uh, hearing his sermon. But uh, probably when I was maybe 12 or 13, 14, I used to play in a, in a music group and every year we did a, a sort of joint concert uh, with a male voice choir. I was quite a cool teenager, obviously, <laughs> <laughs> as you can tell. And, um, and pretty much every year they, they sang that song, Joshua fought the battle of Jericho, and they probably did that and sort of jazz hands at the end. <laughs> and everyone loved it. So everyone tapping their toes, Joshua fought the battle, clapping along and loving it. And uh, we, we have mentioned this morning, it's a favourite story, isn't it? With kids at Sunday school, um, it's a classic, Joshua and uh, the Battle of Jericho. Until perhaps you get towards the end, you might have clocked this this morning, verse 21. They devoted, that's the Israelites, the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it. Men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep and donkeys. Oh, uh, that bit didn't make the final cut for the, uh, the storybook Bibles. Um, that one didn't make the cut for the lyrics and the concert. Can you imagine everyone sort of clapping along and, oh, I, I'm not sure about that. The only problem is it seems to get worse because Deuteronomy 20 tells us that it was actually God himself who commanded them to destroy their enemies. So, Deuteronomy 20, in the cities of the nations, the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. Do not leave alive anything that breathes. Completely destroy them, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, the Jebusites, as the Lord your God has commanded you. Oh, okay. So, so not only are the people sort of seeming to do this, but it seems to be God himself that is standing behind it. And quite obviously, verses and chapters like this that speak of violence in the Old Testament have often been used by those kind of outside of the church to condemn Christianity, to question the character of God himself. So uh, we often go there, don't we? But Richard Dawkins, probably one of the most famous uh, atheists of the last few years. In his book, The God Delusion, he wrote this, and I'll try and try and get this right. He said, the God of the Old Testament is arguably the most unpleasant character in all fiction, a vindictive, bloodthirsty, ethnic cleanser, a misogynistic, homophobic, racist, infanticidal, 
genocidal, filicidal, pestisential, megalomaniac, sadomasochistic, capriciously malevolent bully. Thank you. <laughs> I, I did practice that one before. You know. But Daw obviously Dawkins has clearly swallowed the, the Oxford English Dictionary with such a sentence and paragraph. But actually for those exploring Christianity, the verdict he comes to is pretty unsettling, isn't it? Especially when we read a book like the book of Joshua, perhaps, and read of the violence, or what Dawkins would call ethnic cleansing, genocide. But it's not just those outside of the church uh, who struggle with the violence that we see in the Old Testament. In all honesty, I think it's one of the biggest eth ethical issues that we find in the Old Testament. It would be unusual for any Christian, uh, maybe this was reflected just in your groups minutes ago, uh, to not at points ask questions or be troubled or confused perhaps by some of the violence that we read about in the Old Testament. And perhaps deep down, for some of us even coming out tonight, we're, we're going, OK, I've just heard that quote from Dawkins. Um, how does that square with the God that we say we follow at Mighton? Or the God that we introduce others to, like a course going on next door, Hope Explored? How, how does that square, those two things? Big question, hence why we're looking at it tonight. Before, um, before looking at, at answering or attempting to answer this question, I think it's worth exploring various inadequate solutions that have been put forward to try and, try and sort of get God off the hook, if you like, when it comes to things like this. So some people have said, look, what we need to do when we come to verses like I just quoted at the beginning is kind of just, just gloss over the, the nasty bits in the Bible. Uh, pretend they don't exist because... Perhaps they show a side of God that's best just to kind of be swept under the carpet and ignored. But that is problematic, isn't it? <laughs> Look, as a church, we believe the whole Bible, all of it, is, is God-breathed. It's written by God for us. And so who are we to decide which bits we think, yeah, that makes the cut, that bit let's gloss over. Who are we to decide that? And actually, probably the main nasty bit in the Bible is the crucifixion of God's Son, Jesus Christ. And we don't want to miss that bit or skip over that bit, do we? Another kind of way that uh, people have tried to get around this is say, well, perhaps these mass killings in Joshua never actually happened. Perhaps they were added later uh, by someone else, by a later author. Or, or similarly, perhaps it's not supposed to be read as real and as history, but maybe we can just focus on the moral message or the spiritual message that comes from it. Others have questioned whether God actually commanded any of this, or maybe they misheard God's voice. And they just sort of went for it, and it was, really wasn't what God wanted at all. I think, though, perhaps the most common, and I'm sure a number of us will have come across this, is the view that the God of the Old Testament is very, very different than the God of the New Testament, or particularly the Jesus. This cable is not very happy. I'll try to sort that in a sec. Um, not particularly uh, similar to the God we find in the New Testament. So, an uh, American mega church pastor uh, who's quite influential, a guy called Andy Stanley in the US, uh, he recent, recently wrote a book about this and said, look, as Christians, we need to learn to unhitch our faith from the Old Testament. Um, he is influential. He's probably one of the most listened to pastors, preachers online. And that's talking about passages like that. We need to sort of unhitch, unconnect ourselves from that. Or similarly, Roger Olson, um, who's, a, who's a sort of church historian, Actually, it's a bit naughty to mention this, Ben, but when I started working for UCCF, we were given a book. I don't know if they still are. Um, and he writes loads of really good stuff uh, on church history. Um, but he wrote, wrote this. He said, these accounts of violence don't speak God's voice to me. They're all dark and obscure and frightening. I run to Jesus. Jesus is good for us. Jesus is God for us. And all we need when contemplating the character of God quite tempting isn't it to go down that route perhaps uh, certainly easier isn't it to resonate with Jesus who says love your enemies rather than God seemingly saying commanding them to slaughter other people it's easier isn't it to resonate with with that just at this point it's worth noting though that there's there's nothing new <laughs> about pitting the God of the Old Testament against Jesus or the God of the New Testament it's really a modern variation on what a, a theologian called Marcion 
uh, fa falsely and famously taught in the second century. He famously taught that the God of the Old Testament was very different than the sort of gracious Jesus we see in the New Testament. So much so that he sort of rejected all of the Old Testament pretty much and large parts of the New Testament that, that sort of quoted or spoke of the Old Testament. That meant he was probably left with about that much <laughs> um, at the end. So it's not new, this kind of idea. And um, look, those are just a number of the ways that people have tried to sort of understand or, or maybe get God off the hook a little bit. But I think each of those runs into serious problems along the way. So, <laughs> what do we do when we encounter such passages? How do we respond, whether we're a Christian here tonight or whether we're not? What do we make of these passages, particularly focusing tonight on the conquest uh, that we see in the book of Joshua, because we're in that in the mornings? But this, this topic is not easy. I can't claim that it is. And I can't promise to tie up all the loose ends so that you leave 100% satisfied tonight as you go into your week. But, but actually, I've been so encouraged by some excellent resources that are out there, written by experts in theology and, and archaeology as well. And I'm convinced there are good answers, good answers that help us to make sense a little bit more of what's going on, even if that's not always easy. Uh, I don't know if there's any golf fans. It's the Ryder Cup, isn't it, at the moment? You might have been following that. But I've been, you could say, waggling on the tee for a long time. And now we're going to get going and get started after a very long introduction. I got the sense that there's not a lot of golf fans. So let's, uh, <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's carry on. Um, the first thing I want to say up front is, is to say that what we see in the book of Joshua is not genocide. And it's not ethnic cleansing. Those things are the attempted destruction of a people group on national or religious grounds. So our minds tonight, they might turn to Rwanda. Uh, perhaps to Cambodia, Bosnia, uh, the Holocaust even. What we read in Joshua is very different than those things. The instructions here are given by God to his people as they enter the land for a specific time and with a specific intent, with specific geography. So it's much more accurate to speak of a conquest rather than speaking of genocide. And you might think, it's just a word, is that any different? Well, yes. Because the conquest of, of Canaan is never justified on ethnic grounds in the Bible. If you were here a, a few weeks ago, Ed preached, didn't he, on Joshua chapter 2. And we heard again a mention this morning of Rahab, the Canaanite, living in the land of Canaan, who joined God's people, was welcomed in to God's people. Or you could point to the laws in the Old Testament by, given by God to uh, his people that spoke of foreigners being offered refuge and protection as they came into God's people. In other words, God is not xenophobic. The good news was always to go to the nations. It was to extend to other people, to all people. So we'll come back to that a bit later, but it, it's not ethnic cleansing or genocide that some have tried to point it to. Where are we going then? Okay, uh, three questions I really want to look at tonight. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll wrap it up after that, and then we'll, um, we'll have some time for Q&A hopefully as well. First question uh, then I want us to look at um, is this. So yeah, the three questions. How bloodthirsty was the conquest? How bad were the Canaanites? Isn't God a God of love? And hopefully those kind of tap into some of the questions we might have. First of all then, how, how bloodthirsty was the conquest that we read about? We've maybe established it's not ethnic cleansing, but the language is still pretty bloodthirsty, isn't it? Utterly destroy, put them to death. And as we hear the details of what the Israelites are to do, maybe it just leaves our stomach churning a little bit as we read that. Remember Joshua 21? They destroyed with the sword every living thing in it. That, that sounds pretty bloodthirsty, doesn't it? But actually a number of writers, um, writers like Paul Copan, uh, Joshua Butler, others as well, have argued that the battles in the book of Joshua as they enter into the Promised Land weren't quite as cold-hearted and bloodthirsty as it seems at first sight. So the scope of the conquest were not nearly as brutal as we might have imagined. And actually over 50 times, even in the book of Joshua, we're told that the Israelites were to drive out rather than to wipe out the people of the land. Let me just show you that from a, from a couple of examples. First of all, the dimensions of the cities. 
when um, when Joshua mentions a city, maybe Jericho or AI, um, we naturally, I, I don't know, I do at least, think, think of a modern city, uh, maybe London or Birmingham or, or even Coventry, vast in size, uh, great numbers of people. But actually a number of archaeologists have, have argued that the cities in the Promised Land were largely military strongholds and outposts rather than civilian centres where lots and lots of people lived. So Paul Copan writes, writes this, all the archaeological evidence indicates that no civilian populations existed at Jericho, Ai, and other cities mentioned in Joshua. Jericho was a small settlement of probably 100 or fewer soldiers. This is why all of Israel could circle round it seven times and then do battle against it on the same day. Well, Richard Hess, another Old Testament theologian, uh, suggests that a city like Jericho possibly held 100 to 150 people. And I think that archaeological research changes the picture slightly, maybe that we naturally might have of what we think of as a city. But we might say, okay, how does that fit then with a passage like Joshua 10, where Israel's victories are described as having overcome the whole region with all their kings, leaving no survivors, destroying all who breathed. That's what we see the next thing. Uh, that these verses, of course, they, they seem to, to leave no question that everything is obliterated, annihilated in the land. But again, a good number of writers point to exaggeration or hyperbole, which was pretty standard in the ancient Near Eastern culture of the time, a kind of military bragging uh, that was used by nations and people at the time. Uh, let me just put it in context today. I, th I think we see this kind of thing in the playground or maybe on the sports field. So um, we might call it, well, I don't, but people might call it trash talk. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Tyson Fury totally annihilated his opponent in the boxing last night. And you find out later he just won on points. <laughs> or uh, Liverpool totally destroyed Luton Town. You say, what was the score? Oh, it was 2-0. We, we use this kind of language in every day. It's an exaggerated language to express that one side is victorious over another. So when Israel utterly destroys a city, the picture is often, it seems, a military fort being taken rather than a civilian massacre. Uh, one person, I thought, put it helpfully, Israel is taking out the Pentagon, not New York City. Okay, that's kind of the sense, it seems, of what's going on. And some of you might be thinking, oh, Nathan, it's... Bit, sounds a bit dodgy, sounds like you've lost confidence in the Bible. Well, I think actually if we look at the Bible more closely, we see this to be true as well. So Joshua 10, for example, speaks of no survivors. It speaks of kings being destroyed. But if you flick onto the next book in the Bible, the book of Judges, you'll see that there were still kings there and still people in the land, in that same land, that the people have boasted about wiping out. Ancient trash talk military bragging typical of the day seems to be taking place. So an understanding of, of cities as military outposts, ancient trash talk, and a closer look at the Bible text points to a lot more nuance and a lot less bloodshed. The conquest in Canaan was far less widespread and harsh than many people assume. Or uh, uh, one, another, I don't have this quote up there, um, but another writer, Old Testament scholar, put it like this. Many Canaanites were killed, though not as many as the popular imagination might seem, uh, seems to believe, sorry. And their deaths occurred because they had chosen to place themselves under God's judgment. To read this as extermination is to misread the text. You might think, okay, that's the first thing. So it's, it's slightly less bloodthirsty, maybe, than we see on first appearance. But how could God just let this... You know, these people living in the land, the people of Israel should just go in there and take this land from someone else. We, we're shocked, aren't we, when we see that kind of thing today of, of a people group just going into a land and take it. We're, we're shocked, rightly, aren't we, by that? What's going on here? And, and were the people of the land deserving of such punishment? How bad were the Canaanites, in other words? And let me tell you that the picture the Bible paints of the Canaanites is... Uh, those uh, and the other nations living in the land is not, <coughs> not pretty okay i think there's a bit of a caricature 
uh, that these people were living in the land innocently uh, and they were sort of minding their own business, drinking cups of tea, uh, enjoying this paradise of milk and honey, uh, when suddenly these cruel Israelites just came in with their AK-47s and sort of <laughs> took, took them out, uh, these poor innocent people. But actually, as we look at the Bible, a more accurate picture of the Canaanites shows that they were a deeply wicked people, deserving of God's anger and punishment. We have to go back to Genesis 9, actually, for the first mention of Canaan in the Bible. And that, I think that sets the tone, really, for a people group constantly opposed to God. Listen to this description of the Canaanites and the other nations in Deuteronomy 12. They do all kinds of detestable things that the Lord hates. They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifice to their gods. Don't gloss over that. <laughs> it's easy to, isn't it? They even burn their sons and daughters in the fire as sacrifice to their gods. As Paul Copan, again, I've quoted him already, uh, puts it, what the Canaanites did would be considered criminal in today's world. Incest, bestiality, infant sacrifice, ritual prostitution. The Bible's teaching on God's wrath and God's anger at sin it is, of course, found in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And it is a teaching, isn't it, that, that repels <coughs> many people today. Yet it's clear that the, the evil of the Canaanites had reached a place where God said, look, enough is enough at this point. The cycle of the Canaanites, Canaanites' wickedness and sin needed stopping, according to the Lord. Yes, we need to remember that elsewhere in the Bible, in the Old Testament, we're told that God takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but instead longs for repentance and people to come to him. However, the Bible also does teach that, that God has authority to give life and to take it away. Again, it's worth stressing that this is a unique moment in the history of Israel, God's people. And it is a moral purging rather than a racially motivated ethnic cleansing. <laughs> actually, only a few books later, those of you who know your Bibles, will see that it's actually God's people in the Old Testament who are kicked out of the land also. OK, we've worked through a few things, but how though does this God of judgment and wrath fit with the God in Exodus 34 who is described as gracious, slow to anger, compassionate and abounding in love. <clears throat> Isn't God then a God of, of love? That's what we tell people, so we're comforted by ourselves. And although Richard Dawkins again and, and others would, would kind of point to God as being vengeful and petty in his character, if you read the Bible closely there are clear signs of God's mercy and his love and patience in the book of Joshua. Remember I mentioned uh, that some people kind of see a bit of a contradiction, don't they, between uh, the God of all the Old Testament, the God of Joshua, and sort of Jesus meek and mild in the New Testament. But actually in both Testaments, we see a picture of God's immense love and mercy and patience alongside his wrath and anger at sin. Both the Old Testament and New Testament speak of that. Actually, all the way back, um, in Genesis chapter 15, verse 16, we're told this, that the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. And you think, Nathan, what on earth are you pulling that one out for? In the Old Testament, that seems a bit random. Who are the Amorites? Well, the Amorites were actually the descendants of the Canaanites. And so what you have in, in that verse, even in Genesis, is actually this clear example of God's patience between for those people living in the land. Patience of 400 years for these deeply rebellious and sinful people dwelling in the land. The fact that he didn't judge them straight away it is merciful and patient. It's not until the nations in the land became totally saturated with sin that God's justice falls on them. He is patient with them nearly half a millennia towards those who practised incest and bestiality and child sacrifice. I wonder if we would be as patient as God is to some of these people in the land. We've already mentioned, haven't we, Rahab, 
the Canaanite prostitutes uh, in the land. Christopher Wright, who's a, who's a great Old Testament theologian, uh, puts it like this. He said, it is amazing, and it cannot be accidental, that the opening story in the book of Joshua describes not a conquest, but a conversion. Rahab shows that someone who renounced the gods of Canaan and came to worship the living God was spared. It also shows that there was a way for Canaanites to avoid the destruction if they chose to. We're told uh, in chapter 8 also that there's Canaanites present at a covenant renewal ceremony. Uh, in chapter 9, that I've got to preach in a few weeks and work out what that's all about, we see that there's a treaty made with the Gibeonites, who were spared in the land. Uh, Joshua 11 says that there was an opportunity for Canaanite cities to make peace with Israel. In other words, God was willing to welcome the Canaanites as neighbours, but their sin and rebellion was so deeply ingrained. Guys, you're doing well. I've just got one page of A4 until we uh, take a breather after this. I know there's a lot to get through. But I think at this point, it's, it's important to stress that although there were other wars in the Old Testament that God advocates, Israel, God's people, were, they were never free to just do to the other nations whatever they wanted. So Deuteronomy 20.10 shows that war and conquest was sort of last resort, really, and peace was always to be pursued where possible. And that is a vital truth for Christians today to grasp as well. See, the Bible does not teach a general grounds for, for genocide or holy war. What we see in Joshua is not and never has been a pattern for Christians to follow. The reality is each one of us in this room knows that unfortunately Christians or those behaving and acting in the name of the church have got this wrong at many times in history, which is devastating and which is wrong. And so for Christians living this side of the cross, we are to be reminded and to, be remem to remember that, that Jesus preached a, a message of peace and love for enemies. He urged his disciples not to use violence to defend him, even when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Ultimately, because justice is in God's hands, we don't have to take it into our hands. That's a lot of content, I'm aware, um, in a room that seems to be getting hotter. It's not, it's not the lightest, is it, of topics um, to tackle, and I, and I never promised it was going to be that. But what have we seen? What have we seen if we work through this? Well, we've seen that although the conquest passages in the book of Joshua often cause confusion and doubts, for non-Christians and Christians alike, there are resources to help us understand what is going on. There is strong evidence, I, I want to say, that the conquests were not as bloodthirsty as many suggest, when bearing in mind the ancient trash talk and the, the size and mostly military population of the cities being attacked. But also we need to take into account the, the wickedness, as we've seen, of the people of Canaan and the immense patience and grace of God as well in the book of Joshua. And rather than pitting the God of the Old Testament against the, the New Testament, you know, the caricature, God of the Old Testament says genocide is fine, and, and that Jesus says no, no, no. <laughs> the Bible instead presents an attractive picture of a holy God who cares about justice, yet shows great patience and mercy towards the people he has made. And it is with Jesus that, that I want to finish. Because in the person of Jesus, we, well, we see God in human flesh, who is both loving and patient, yet serious about sin and judgment. Uh, to borrow a phrase from C.S. Lewis, he's good, but he's not tame. And his patience, the Bible says, will not last forever. And it is, of course, at the cross, isn't it, where we see wonderfully justice and love coming together as Jesus willingly takes the full force of the anger and wrath of God. Like the Canaanites, we deserve that wrath and judgment and justice. Yet through Jesus Christ, we get mercy and love. And so we can affirm Exodus 34, the Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, and abounding in love and faithfulness.
There we go. There's a lot to take in. What I would suggest we do now, just for a few minutes again uh, in your groups, a couple of questions to think through. What, what was new to you or helped you to see what was going on, on in the book of Joshua? Uh, did these ex explanations help? I haven't put a question mark after that one. I don't know what you can make of that what you want. I think that's me being laid. Just before we um, get to the q and I'll just flag up a few things that I, I found helpful in, in reading on this. Uh, a book called uh, The Skeletons in God's Closet. It's a good title, isn't it? Uh, by a guy called Joshua Butler, um, who who's written on this and a number of other topics. That's quite a good sort of entry levels, a popular level um, work, working through some of these questions. Um, Alan Miller really kindly lent me this book by the man I mentioned, Paul Copan, Is God a Vindictive Bully? Reconciling Portrayals of God in the Old and New Testament. That was written last year. Some fascinating questions and, and it touches on this as well in a few chapters. Um, and then uh, there's, a, there's an essay or an article, again, a bit more of a intermediate to advanced, if you like, uh, one on this as well. So do you borrow either of these from me, um, Alan. I'm sure if someone wants to borrow this, uh, uh, we'll chat to Alan about that as well. Uh, if if those those things help. Any any questions? Any comments from what we looked at? When we think about the Israelites exterminating the Canaanites. We should remember that in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, God says several times that he's going to drive them out yeah. before the Israelites get there. Yeah. So that there wouldn't have been so many Canaanites yeah. for them to deal with. Yes. Thank you, Anna. Fantastic. You know, after the Battle of Jericho, many of the Canaanites sued for peace mm -hmm. and, lost, and many of the cities. Yeah. And they had some new subterfuge to try to yeah no it's good and and i mentioned gibeon briefly but in chapter nine it feels like there's, an, there's a sort of a bit of an alliance we come to it where lots of the other nations sort of understandably say let's let's all kind of come together because these people have got you know what's going on here and fight together. and actually the gibeonites go no we're gonna we'll question what they do <laughs> i need to work out whether it's good or bad um but they they don't stand with the others and they sort of seek refuge at the very least in in coming alongside God's people or being with them, like Rahab. In some ways. Yeah. Uh, if we're wrong, did not, I, I thought that, that God told the Israelites to drive the foreign nations out yeah. of the land. Yeah. And I've always understood that that didn't actually happen yeah. completely. Um, yeah. And there was, there was intermarrying and yeah. there was the foreigners living yeah. among them. Was that not disobedience by Israel? Yeah. And actually, if they had obeyed God, wouldn't it have meant that actually they would have been cleared out from Israel? No forgiveness needed. That's all. That's all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's a good point. And so actually, that's partly why the Book of Judges is such a nightmare. I mean, Joshua was quite. Yeah. There's there's a few bits like we've tried to talk about tonight, but Joshua's going like, yeah, go on, go on, Joshua. Everything's going. Seems to be going well, and then you get to Judges, and you go, "This is a moral nightmare," because of actually the failure of God's people to do what they were supposed to do, and so then they get caught up in all of the, um, all of the idolatry and all those kind of things as well, and it goes <laughs> pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. Any Wouldn't it be totally unrealistic if you go back in history for the Israelites to to behave, if you like, in a different way from all the cultures around them. <laughs> Whether you're looking at the Greek wars or the Roman wars, or it was just the way things were. Um, nations or tribes or whatever um, attacked each other and that, that, that was going on. That was that. And it, of course, it's no different today in many ways. Yeah. Well, in every way. I mean, World yeah. War I and mean, yeah. the biggest Often the biggest moral dilemma for people in the 20th century, for example, my parents and yeah. things like that, was what is a just war? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, it's easy if you can see the Nazis, <laughs> but it's, yeah. it's less clear in other, in other situations. Yeah. So it's kind of two, two parts to that. I mean, the first is, a, and again, maybe I could have stressed it a little bit more, but often, we saw this morning, didn't we? It was God who fought the battle. The Lord fought the battle. So that was that is quite unique from... Oh, we're going to have a go at you, and you're going to have a go at us, and we're going to fight. It was 
this is unique in, in the way that God is doing that. I mean, when it comes to, I, I'm not an expert on this, and I, I need to probably do a lot more thinking about it, and others will have different views perhaps, but, you know, some have, um, yeah, the question of do you read these passages or the Old Testament with, uh, and then sort of come to a conclusion of being a, a pacifist now, so war is, is never the answer, and you'll always look for peace. Others have, have obviously, as you suggested, gone, that is a just war, we should fight. Um, and it's interesting how people have used the book of Joshua to, to fight for both positions on that. So I think some, uh, some, if you're more of a sort of pacifist persuasion, if you like, saying peace is all the answer, um, their point of Joshua and say, well, God's doing the fighting here. Uh, the people are just blasting a trumpet. Oh, I love that, playing, playing a trumpet. Um, but they're just blasting a trumpet and walking around. It's God, God who's doing it. So that shows us that we should be pacifists. Uh, on, the, on the other hand, we're, uh, those who kind of argue more for a, for a just war kind of um, sentiment today would say that in the Old Testament, we're seeing the, the kind of wars where it was right to fight, <laughs> where there was enough of an issue where... Um, weapons should be taken up and so the bible informs our just wars if you like today and so it's interesting how i think how the book of joshua has has led people to both of those positions and uh maybe maybe another a big questions um someone other than me can <laughs> do, do one on that maybe we could look at that um is it ever right for for christians to to go to war should we support wars it's probably slightly beyond my remit tonight um, what would you say to the question, um, if when the Israelites were invading this, the different cities yeah. and they were, it's basically God's judgment mm -hmm. on the cities because of their idolatry, the yeah. Canaanites' idolatry, was it not like God doing, getting the Israelites to do his dirty work for them? <laughs> why, why didn't he just... Well, sometimes he does. Yeah. Um, and so... Uh... But yeah, there are a number of occasions, aren't there, in the Old Testament where the Lord literally you know, sends the hornet or starts it and, and does it like that. Um, I guess sometimes it's used, I mean, the, the example of someone like uh, Gideon in the book of Judges, isn't it? So uh, that's an interesting example where you go, uh, top of my head, 32,000 or something in the army, and he's going, we're ready. And he says, no, reduce, reduce your numbers down. Keep reducing it. Is, is it to get to 300? Mm -hmm. Someone's going to nod. Yeah. yeah. Um, it gets to 300 in the end. And so a little bit like Ben was suggesting this morning, it, it kind of, it was an opportunity for the people of God's faith to be strengthened as part of that, of going, are we really going to, to, to trust the Lord, even if this looks em embarrassing? Obedience is the phrase wasn't it, Ben used this morning. And so partly if God is doing something to his, pe to his people and working in them, rather than just going, oh, I'll keep my hands <laughs> clean it up. Alan, have you got any more co any comments on that? No, I, I was just thinking uh, later on we find God using the Assyrians, mm -hmm. for yeah. example, to punish the Israelites and yeah. the Babylonians yeah. and Cyrus. They're all called God's servant. Yeah. yeah. In that purpose. Yeah. I was going to make another comment. People often say, Jesus is mm. kind and loving mm. and in contrast to the God of the Old Testament. But remember that he was the one who said, if someone upsets one of these little ones, they should be thrown in the sea and drowned. Yeah. And uh, John 3.16, we all know well, mm. is followed by yeah. those who don't believe are condemned mm. already. Mm. So we see God's justice yes. in the Saviour. Or, Just as we do in the Old Testament. Seriously helpful. And, and you know, or even further, Revelation 17 19, Jesus riding on the wheels of judgment in there as well. So we need to, it's right, isn't it, as you know, those of us who are Christians here to, to go, am I, is the Jesus that I'm picturing the one sort of of, of the story Bibles of little children sitting on his lap? And it, yes, that is one of the pictures, but it's not the only picture yeah. as well. And to have a, a bigger picture of who Jesus is is, is what we all want to. To work towards, isn't it? Hannah, did you have a question? Or was it a stretch? Um, I did not. Um... It was a stretch. <laughs> <laughs> Fine. Hugh, yeah. Uh, can I take you up a little bit on yeah. this issue of the trashing yeah. language? Yeah. So what you're, and I think it's a helpful idea that you suggested to us that 
we read some of the descriptions in Joshua at face value, whereas actually the literary form in which they are written yeah. suggests that they, that they shouldn't be taken quite so literally. But isn't that um, sort of a slightly slippery slope? Because yeah. if we say, yeah, yeah. well, some of the things in the Old Testament yeah, yeah. We, yeah. we accept as, as sort of yeah. literally true yeah. and others are only figuratively yeah. true. But, you know, I, I think it is a helpful uh, uh, I, idea that you, you suggested yeah. to us. Yeah, really, really, really good question. And, you know, I'll be the last person in the room to want us to sort of go down a down a route where we go, oh, it's, you know, that probably doesn't mean that. Well, let's take it as that. I mean, that's the, in a sense, yeah, you're right. That's the slope that some of those uh, getting God off the hook options that I, you know, I mentioned, right, that's not working, um, right at the beginning of kind of the, um, oh, maybe it didn't happen historically, you know, kind of route to lib liberal theology, essentially, is in that. I, I think, I think, though, looking at this is, so the trash talk thing that I mentioned, or that sort of hyperbole, that is not to accuse the Bible writers, writers of lying, um, but rather, I think, using the, the literary conventions of the day. And so it plays into a sort of the way that we read the, the whole Bible more, um, you know, it's, it's a kind of classic illustration, but you, you read a newspaper in different ways, don't you? So you won't read <coughs> at the front pages about a war somewhere in the way that you read about the sports results from last night or the the gossip column of, you know, I know you don't read those papers, um, but, you know, you, you read a newspaper differently, don't you? And I think, in a sense as well, with the Bible, you're wanting to read what it, was the context here, what is going on um, in this particular part of the Bible. So, yeah, hopefully that helps a little bit. John, you talked about that a little bit. <coughs> We've been we're saying that um, actually the trash talk, as it were, seems undoubtedly true in terms of what comes later yeah. but the question i guess we had was how does it actually get god off the hook in as far as god still is dem commanding demanding yeah. of the israelites that they do come and wipe out the city and yeah. is that also hyperbole yeah. or is it is it that god is demanding the full um, sort of elimination yeah. Do you see what I mean? Isn't in some ways it's okay that the yeah. hyperbole is there for yeah. what actually takes place. Yes. But what is it that God is actually? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, oh, that's a very, very, very good question, and I think um, again, Alan, Alan's got much more experience on this. So do chip in after me, Alan, on this. I, I think <clears throat> it's not a matter of God. God says it as it is, and and the Bible writers kind of use hyperbole. So um, I, I think we want to be a bit a bit careful of of that sometimes something is, is stated isn't it in the bible by god as, as to happen and then he is um, wonderfully so much more gracious than we might imagine so i was talking with one of the students at the lunch about sodom and gomorrah and it seems like that's going to be sort of you know full-on sort of nuclear button and then there's that conversation isn't there between abraham and god and and sort of there's fewer and fewer people, uh, you know, it's sort of uh, a killed us. So often it will be stated very plainly, and then you'll see these wonderful occurrences of people being brought into God's people, like Rahab, the Gibeonites, and others. Um, so both of those things are true, if you like, uh, in that. Uh, Alan, do you want to add anything to that? Yes, this is a matter of reading the text of literature. Yeah. We have to understand that. Uh, Things were expressed in certain ways to give an effect. Yeah. But when it comes to destroying the Canaanites, there's a particular Hebrew word you have, para, yeah. which means absolutely destroying yeah. or devoting to God as the mm. gold and silver and so on were at Jericho. So that nobody else could have any use. Mm. They had no more life, as it were. Yeah. And that's that's quite clear mm. in Joshua. Yeah. And it occurs in one or two other ancient texts too, there's a famous inscription by a king of Moab in which he said he did that to some Israelites yeah. who were living you know, east of the Jordan. Mm. So it wasn't something peculiar yes. to Israel yeah, yeah. to wipe out a group of enemies. Absolutely. So it would have been understood in that way. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And I think <coughs> Copan's good on that, isn't he, as well? Yeah. Have we time for one more? Is there a question? <coughs> 
we all have, God has our lives and our deaths in each one of our hands, yeah. his hands. Yeah. And that's always there. So he always chooses. Yeah. And he has the right to do that and accept that for us. And and he always provides a way mm. in which we can be saved. And that, that's been always so. Yeah. And that's why I think it's so yeah, so encouraging to read those stories of un of unlikely people being saved, isn't it, all the way through the Bible. To see of God's patience towards people who don't deserve it and love towards people. And um yeah. Yeah, it's good. It just feels like a good place to, to finish on. Thank you, Richard. Good. Well, thank, thanks everyone for coming tonight. I think we've got we've got another big question. I should know this in my <laughs> yeah. There's other things coming up this term <laughs> on Sunday nights. Is there another big questions? There will be at some point. And um, I think just just to say as well, if if you've got both for big questions and equip, we we want to be doing. We want to be answering and looking at the questions that you that you're asking or friends of yours are asking maybe at, at work and and those kind of things and um i i found a couple of times that people have pulled out the sort of uh you know the crusades argument as the sort of uh this is why i'm not a christian because of those crusades that happened you know 900 years ago and uh i always sort of think is, is that really your reason <laughs> but actually sometimes it's good isn't it just to have a few a few lines or uh, a few things we might say. So if there's particularly big questions you've got or um, or others have that you want us to address similarly with, with the equip stuff, do, um, do let me know about that as well. But thanks for coming tonight. We'll see you soon. Thank you.